2022 reminds me of Jan 21. We had the hopes of COVID ebbing, world economy coming back on its feet, India gaining at the expense of China, and the world becoming more prosperous. Fast forward to 2022. We have come a long way, but there's still a lot more room to go ahead. This year is very critical because it marks the 75th year of India's independence. And we can proudly say that we are 75 years young. I'm sure all of you have the same questions in mind today. What are the latest trends in finance and economics? Where does India stand vis-a-vis -vis the world? And what do our capital markets have in store with, for us? Today, we have with us Mr. Nilesh Shah to answer this and much more. He needs no introduction. He is the Managing Director and the Group President at Kotak Mahindra Asset Management Company Limited. He is also the Member of Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. Thank you, sir, for joining in. I wish you a very happy new year. Thank you, Meka and Harsh. It's my pleasure to be here. Wish you and all your viewers a very happy and healthy new year. Let me begin by asking you on the global macro trends. Where we are seeing somewhat mixed signals. We have US on one hand, which is showing strong growth and high inflation. We also have most of the European region and China, which is showing some signals of macro weaknesses. EMs are having currency pressure and inflation as well. To top it up, we have commodities and COVID, which are further adding to the volatility. How do we read all this with respect to world growth in 2022? So different countries are at different stages of economic cycle. US is the only country which has reserve currency status. They can spend their money. They can print, they can cut a tree, put it some green ink on it. And this will be called a billion dollar. Now, they have gone on the path of fiscal and monetary stimulus. Their Fed rate is 0 0.25, when inflation last was reported around 7%. Uh, at one point of time, some time back, Americans sitting at home were getting more money from government being unemployed than what they would have got flipping a burger in McDonald's joint. Clearly, their growth is strong because the fiscal stimulus, the monetary stimulus has been very strong. The opposite side is China. Their growth is strong because they are on a debt splurge. For every dollar of GDP which they are creating, they have to incur debt of $4. Uh, their debt splurged growth is you know, giving them risk as well as the upside. Europe is an aging population. The average age of European is now touching towards 50. And clearly they are more like Japan, though Japan is even more aged in terms of their cycle. So each country is on its own in terms of the path they have chosen. But it will be fair to say a few things. One, central bankers around the world are like USS Enterprise and Star Trek to boldly go where no man has gone before. They are all walking on the path of Bank of Japan, which pumped liquidity for three decades, which brought interest rates to zero, which uh, monetized government's debt by buying you know, government borrowing program, and which has now gone and started buying equity. Today, Bank of Japan is the largest owner of equity, Japanese equity in the world. So it's very evident that central bankers will continue to support economy through easy monetary policy, even if it means they have to ignore inflation for a while. The combined balance sheet of top three central banks, US, EU, Bank of Japan was about $5 trillion in 2008. Today it is $25 trillion plus in 2021. The second thing is concern on inflation. It has gone up as China reduced supply because of Winter Olympics to curb pollution. And 
the demand went up as most countries around the world provided fiscal and monetary stimulus. So demand went up, supply came down, naturally prices will go up. We believe post winter Olympics, China will ease the supply pressure. Uh, that should increase supply. As the fiscal and monetary stimulus gets unwounded, the demand also will naturalize. Again, that will bring commodity prices down and put some sort of cap on the inflation. So this is the global macro, huge liquidity, extremely low interest rates, fixed income giving negative real return, liquidity pumping up asset prices all across from equity to unlisted equity to cryptos to NFTs. And inflation, while it is elevated, likely to come down as demand neutralizes and supply increases. So I think, you know, you touched on a vast uh, trend and, you know, we would like to take up all of it in further details. So speaking about China in particular, you know, uh, we see that there's a large crackdown on Chinese companies, you know, across sectors, be it real estate, health tech, ed tech, etc. We're also seeing China on the mode of deleveraging. And as you alluded to, they're becoming increasingly environment conscious now. Uh, we're also seeing an anti-capitalist approach and a change in demographics. Now, we understand that these factors could be a drag as far as the Chinese economy is concerned. Now, in the wake of all this, how do you see the flow coming to emerging markets, especially to countries like that of India? So, already in emerging market, there is a separation happening. At one point of time, nomenclature was BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Today, Brazil and Russia and South Africa are 5 to 10 PE countries. Uh, China is 15 to 20, and India is 20 to 25. Clearly, within BRICS, India is a standout compared to others. Why did this happen? It happened primarily because India focused on variety of things. The first is environmental, social, and governance practices. In China, Jack Ma, maybe the most successful Chinese entrepreneur, could be thrown out of his own company in no time. In Russia, Mikhail Khodorovsky, the richest Russian, was thrown out of his oil company in no time. South Africa has its own racial tension and inequality problems to cater to. Brazilian political system has gone for a toss. In that peer group, India stands out. It is the only country in the world which is achieving its Paris Accord target of 40% total, total power capacity is renewable. We had promised we will do that in 2030. We are doing that in 2021, nine years ahead. Russia and China boycotted COP26 at Glasgow. We were there. And we boldly committed that by 2070, India will become net neutral. Our governance practices are far, far superior to most of the emerging market peers, and in many aspects comparable to the best in the world. On social standard, again, our corporate sector, thanks to 2% CSR says, have been doing a wonderful work. Now, you look at from the prism of global capital, which country is going to give a comparable ESG practices like India? Probably there is none in emerging market. The second thing is entrepreneurship. Forget India. Indians are ruling the rust in almost all over the world. Whether it's European company, American company, Southeast Asian company, they need Indian talent. You will find Indian in all these places in top management. Now, the same entrepreneurship is prevailing in India. We have created more unicorns than China this year. So you have entrepreneurship, you have growth, you have governance, you have environmental and social standards. What more do an investor need? Of course, they would like to buy India cheaper, but then quality never comes cheap. So my feeling is that in the global emerging market flows, India has distinguished itself and as long as we deliver on growth with green, governance, 
growth, environmental and social standards. All these things will ensure that global capital will continue to flow towards India. Last year, FPIs were net sellers in secondary market, but they were buyers in primary market. Even if we combine primary and secondary, their net buying was roughly about 25,000 crore. Compared to that, they are putting in 25,000 crore virtually every month into Indian private equity. So there is excess global capital, which is waiting to be deployed. And I don't think so FPIs are going to get a better place than India to invest into. Right, so as you often say, Sari Jaha Te Achha Hindustan Hamada. But now we are discussing India. Let's discuss another key growth driver, which is the consumption. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the data suggests that over the last six years, there has been a significant change as far as the earnings potential of the middle class Indian is concerned. Now, uh, population earning more than $2,000 has increased from 100 million to about 500 million. So, what in your view could be the effect? of this change in the earnings potential, which can change the consumer behavior, which in turn can definitely change the growth trajectory of India. I think in some sense, Indian cricket team represents India. There was a time in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and even 90s, where occasionally we will go and win a test match or a one day international. Uh, we were producing some brilliant uh, batsmen like Sunil Gavaskar or Vijay Merchant or Mansoor Ali Khan Patodi. We will produce some great spinners. But as a team, we were never consistently winning the matches. Post Saurav Ganguly, we started creating team which was winning the matches not only in India, but also outside. Now, this is the transition of Indian cricket team, where from individual brilliance, we move to collective brilliance, where from inconsistent performance, we move to consistent performance. And this change was driven by kind of tier two towns. There was a time when an Indian cricket team would have been called Sivaji Park Jim Khana cricket team because Many players were from Mumbai playing in Sivaji Park, Jim Khanna. Today, we have seen people coming from all over the country. The same transition hap is happening in Indian economy. Uh, we were individually brilliant occasionally in the past, but collectively, we always underperformed our peers. In 1983, Indian and Chinese GDP per capita GDP was the same. Today, it is five times bigger. Every single country outperformed us, whether it's Bangladesh, whether it's Sri Lanka, whether it's uh, Taiwan, Korea, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, Japan, they all outperformed us. So obviously, there was something which we were not doing right. Now, today's India has a great opportunity. We have learned from our mistakes of the past. We are not really repeating them. Let me just give you a change of today's India. If you remember earlier Hindi movies like Mother India, Kali Charan, Roti Kapra or Makan, the villain was a black marketeer. Now tell me one last Hindi movie or a you know, regional movie where villain was a black marketeer. It's not there. Why is not there? Because we have moved from high inflation to moderate inflation economy. I sometimes feel proud when an analyst says that India is facing higher inflation. This is first probably one of the few times in our history where our inflation is lower than America and people are saying that we have high inflation. That is our tolerance for inflation. Earlier, 10-12% normal lagta tha, aaj 6% jada lagta hai. Pre-90s, we were virtually hand-to-mouth on our FX reserves. Hawala market was the reality. Now tell me, when did you last thought about Hawala? Forget transaction, even thought about Hawala. It's no longer there because we are holding the fourth largest FX reserves in the world. 
our country has transited from low FX reserves to high FX reserves. We were always infrastructure constrained. Power cuts were way of life for us. I remember traveling Mumbai to Pune. It was an overnight journey. And when you are going in bus on a ghat, you will start praying to God. Today, Mumbai Pune is one and a half hour journey, provided I get out of Mumbai traffic. Our ports, our power generation, our roads, our highways, our airports, our airlines, they are now comparable with the best in the world. We have transited from infrastructure deficit to infrastructure availability. We are not infrastructure surplus economy. There are pockets of pain like Mumbai local train. They still operate at five times the intended capacity. But hopefully metros will change that. Earlier, we were all physical infrastructure. Today, we are physical plus digital infrastructure. There was a colonial magazine reporter who stayed in India for three, four years. Couldn't find anything good about India. Always kept on bitching about India. Because he bitched so much, he was promoted to France. The first tweet he made after reaching France, when I want to shift money from one bank account to another bank account in India, it happened instantly thanks to IMPS. The damn thing takes three days in France. The guy who couldn't see anything good in India while staying here for four years started realizing how good India was when he, when, when, when he was taken out of here. This is the power of our digital infrastructure. For whole my life, uh, whole my early life, I had seen my NRI relatives coming and saying that Hamare US mein, Hamare Britain mein to aisa hota hai, Tumhare India mein ye hai. I have repaid all that collectively when they came last time that look, in your Britain, in your US, vaccination certificates are physically delivered. In my India, we get it digitally. That's the power of our digital infrastructure. We are also moving from crony capitalism to meritocracy. There was a time when if in order to get something, you had to take shortcuts, whether it's telecom spectrum, whether it's coal mines, whether it's iron ore mines, whether it's resources. Today, a lot of it has changed to meritocracy. I'm not saying that we have become absolutely honest, but there is a significant change. The entrepreneurs are not resorting to take shortcuts. These are all the changes which will impact India. But there are two big things which is impacting India the maximum. One, in my generation, or Harsh, in your generation also, if you wanted to uh, start a business, you essentially needed your parents' capital or your relatives' capital. Without their money, there was no way you could have started business or you could have scaled up business. Today, your daughter, my daughter, your kids, my kids, they don't need our capital. If they have idea, they'll get funding from private equity venture capital space. This availability of capital to entrepreneurs is going to change India. Suddenly, like Mahinder Singh Dhoni came from Ranchi and became a smashing batsman, wicketkeeper, and a captain, someone from lower middle class, upper middle class, poor class will come, raise capital and create a unicorn. Availability of capital is unleashing the talent of entrepreneurship. And finally, the government is moving away from running businesses to public-private partnership. There are lots of vested interests which is still persisting on commanding heights to public sector enterprises. But the examples are there. Hindustan Zinc, in 2003, SPSU was producing 100,000 tons of zinc. Today, in a public-private partnership, it's producing 1.8 million tons of zinc. 2003, it was a loss-making company. 2021, it's profitable company. Uh, Air India with the Tatas was a niche airline, but the respected airline. Under public sector undertaking, it just kept on guzzling cash. Now with Tatas, can it go back to its original glory? There is a reasonably good chance. It's going to be a tough task, but it's possible that Tatas will bring Air India to its glory. And then our domestic tourism, international tourism can take off. So 
this is the change which india has transited moderate inflation high fx reserves infrastructure availability digital infrastructure along with physical infrastructure meritocracy availability of capital for real entrepreneurs and government encouraging public private partnership these are the constraints which had restricted india and made it underperform its peer group now with those restrictions gone hopefully we will close our gap with the peer group right i think that was a plethora of very very interesting analogies uh, thanks for that and uh, you know i would just like to uh, you know uh, touch upon something uh, wherein we said about collective behavior and i would just like to you know root it to a behavioral uh, trend wherein you know a lot of collective wisdom relates to market in the short term now uh, what we have seen is that there has been a change in the behavior of the investors as we speak now if i look at the market rally between 2009 and 2020 it was largely institutional investors led but today as we speak we see a lot of mean trading in the us we see a lot of fip culture in india option trading in korea and taiwan etc we are seeing that retail investors are kind of becoming as important as professional investors now in your opinion can this become a double edged sword wherein they are getting flows but you know from those investors who believe in the concept of renting stocks rather than buying stocks so india is now probably 5 6 crore investors uh, there is no heterogeneousness among them uh, so th- there is no homogeneousness among them it's heterogeneous group there are young people there are old people there are inexperienced people there are experienced people there are traders there are investors there are immatures there are matures so it will be very very difficult to uh, categorize this entire retail investor community as one to me their uh, maturity has gone up substantially uh, i remember in 2000 or 2008 when markets corrected uh, most of the retail investors will end up selling uh, they were so indented by the lo- losses that they'll actually end up converting their emotional loss into real loss by selling at the bottom march 20 you know people were down 50% plus in their portfolio and they were there to buy not everyone bought but majority of them bought and they bought not by bidding up prices but letting fpi sell at a lower and lower and lower level if retail investors wanted nifty would not have gone into four digits but they allowed fpis to dump their shares at throw away prices and moment their selling stop they brought back nifty back to four digits i think retail investor has become extremely matured most of the retail investors have learned their lessons very well by reading by observing by listening and i think we are in safe hands there will be always some retail investors who will make mistakes but i'm sure they will learn very very fast so thank you for your insight on that and uh, it is really interesting when you said that retail investors have matured because uh, most of the people around on twitter social media keep on saying immaturity among retail investors and uh, this was a very interesting thought from you uh, so now my next question is about uh, which you touched a bit about valuations of uh, indian equity market and um, we always uh, say that you know two wrongs don't make it right but 100 wrongs make it right and this seems to be the nature of some pockets of the market when we look at a few businesses commanding a very rich valuation so how do you make sense out of this so her beauty is in the eye of beholder what i may find beautiful you may find completely not beautiful uh at the end of the day her there is liquidity it's a rising tide now in rising tide all boats get lifted and if you compare nft versus listed equity you will come to the conclusion that listed equity is very very cheap if you compare crypto valuations and i can't even tell crypto valuation because you can value something which is a fundamental in crypto there's no fundamental compared to that then listed companies looks very very cheap you compare deals in unlisted market private equity market the listed equity looks very very cheap 
you compare indian stocks visa vis russian and brazil stocks our market looks horribly expensive so again valuations you have to look at it from different context undoubtedly there is a small part of market where we believe valuations are sky high and they are driven not by fundamentals but because there is very very concentrated holding few hands control the float the floating stock itself is limited and that's why they can print any price they want this kind of stocks will give you short term performance but over longer term they will create pain this is the segment which one should completely avoid and if you want to invest because of greed then please trade don't invest over there you remove that 10 15% of the market rest of the market looks fairly priced it's not cheap like march to october 2020 but it's not expensive like it was in jan 2008 or the small and mid caps in 2018 it's a market where we are getting premium valuation over our, over our peers because of our practices our growth our governance our commitment to environmental and social standards they are far better than rest of the peers and hence we are deservedly getting that valuation can our valuations become cheaper undoubtedly yes will it remain cheap forever answer is undoubtedly no as long as we deliver on growth and governance our premium valuation should sustain very well said sir growth and governance and that's where i think you and your funds and your team's uh, selection of stocks has been extremely encouraging so you mentioned about valuation and you touched upon private space also so my next question is about that uh, we all remember 2011 when uh, inmobi became the first unicorn in india and while we speaking now we have more than 80 unicorns in india and who would have thought that 50% of these would get this status in 2021 itself uh, and the beauty of this space is that we are seeing uh, unicorns getting created across industries and money is available from uh, early stage to the pre ipo stage so now uh, with a valuation of around 250 billion dollars uh, do you think a this boom in private space is sustainable and b uh, has it become a viable asset class for retail investors to look at so one is business point of view other is valuation point of view i think from a business point of view we have just started uh when mahinder singh dhoni came from ranchi to participate in indian cricket team it actually opened the flood gates for rest of the regions to contribute and we are now seeing in ipl matches in our own t20 one day and test matches how let's say semi urban and rural india players are playing an important role uh the availability of capital is unleashing entrepreneurship and those entrepreneurs are leveraging technology to create solutions which are probably not even existing in western world uh we may not be manufacturer to the world like china but we are definitely software service provider to the world it will be not very unfair to make a statement little exaggeration that every single code written in the world there is some indian connection there now we can leverage this outsourcing into many other things like education like medical and so on and so forth so per se unlisted space entrepreneurship businesses i think what we have seen is just the trailer the real movie is about to begin the second thing is valuation now here i have my own concerns i think many businesses are getting valued at a much much higher level than listed market if you take india's topmost logistics companies which are listed their combined market cap is less than one unlisted logistics company which is far smaller in size and scale so valuation wise will there be correction uh, i hope there will be correction i hope there will be parity between unlisted and listed markets valuation at some point of time but from a business point of view this is just a take off stage what uh, and so what about um, retail investors looking at this asset class as a viable option 
undoubtedly retail investors should participate in this asset class. And this is coming from a person who does not have any interest in private equity or venture capital as a fund house. But this is an interesting way to participate in the entrepreneurship of India. However, a couple of observations. One, instead of getting concentrated, it's far better to be diversified. You don't put all eggs in one basket, applies over here. Number two, when you are trying to invest, uh, you can do it on your own. Like there are so many angel networks. Or you can do it through a fund. If you have capability to do on your own, good enough. Otherwise, better take help of a professional fund manager. Number three, in this field, the experience is that out of 100 company which you invest, maybe 70 or 80 fails, maybe 10, 15 just survives, and 5, 10 grows multiple times. So if there are losses in the initial phases, don't get worried, don't get disturbed. Just continue the journey. You may be just one investment away from a jackpot. So with this caveat, one can invest into this asset class. And as I mentioned, this is high risk, high return asset class. So you need to maintain a disciplined allocation. So thank you for your honest view on this. And you rightly said you don't have any interest in this asset class as a business, but still um, you were very uh, categorical and very transparent in your views. Thanks a lot for that. So sir, um, while we discuss different elements of global market, Indian market, it won't be prudent for us not to discuss risk. Um, if we look at the risk which have been, uh, which we have been looking at for last you know few quarters, uh, these are like the rise in interest rate, uh, deglobalization, COVID resurgence. And now we are looking at a risk which was not uh, a risk for last decade. And that is inflation, which you mentioned about in your first answer also. Now, so the reasons for inflation could be many, like you mentioned about surge in demand, or it could be that we never invested into our supply chains. Key ingredients or key raw materials like chips are in shortage in the world today. We have commodities like crude oil, metals, where the price volatility has been very, very high. The world has become so ironical that today a ship stuck in a canal can impact the entire global trade. So in a simple one line sentence, if I have to ask you, uh, is inflation back? If yes, what is the impact of this? So I will still believe that inflation has come more because of supply side disturbances and it will ease off all commodities when their price rise because demand has gone up and supply has come down, follow a natural cycle where higher prices activate the dormant supplies. Higher prices also deter or defer demand and equilibrium comes for commodity prices to come down. Uh, we believe as fiscal stimulus eases off, as monetary stimulus gets withdrawn, there will be perceptible impact on the demand. The supply side will start coping with demand and there will be equilibrium and hence inflation will remain under control. Undoubtedly inflation is elevated, but is, it is unlikely to remain elevated for long. So we also hope so. And I think many central banks are echoing the view which you had on inflation. Um, so now we are towards the end of our discussion and we can't end our discussion without touching upon a topic which invariably end up becoming a dinner table conversation wherever you go these days. So terms like meme stocks, IPOs, SPACs, NFTs, coins, tokens, countries like El Salvador accepting bitcoins, uh, many central bank trying their own digital currency. So, so much is happening in such a short span of time. How do we read and understand all this? Very tough question. We are also trying to run very, very hard. And, uh, you know, there is a proverb in Gujarati which says that Aduro gado chalkai gado. If pot is half filled, it actually spills more water. What does that mean? Half knowledge is even more dangerous. And I realized that while doing research on COVID, uh, we were following tweet handles of many known personalities. We were reading 
uh, through Google searches, medical journals and publications like Lancet. And uh, we were, uh, you know, participating in discussion blogs and so on and so forth. One thing I realized over a period of time that there are huge wasted interest which actually leverages social media to spread misinformation, to deter you from taking right decision. And you can't read everything as gospel's truth. You'll have to take a lot of things with a pinch of salt. Uh, many a times it is unconscious bias, many a times it is conscious bias. So one thing you'll have to remember is that all of us have our own limitations and restrict constraints. Uh, can I be expert on everything? Answer is no. Number two, do I have to know everything? Answer is again, no. The world is in 24 by 7 by 365, you know, news stories and breaking news. Uh, in reality, 90% is noise or 95% is noise. I just have to focus on 4 or 5%. If I can narrow down my things on differentiating between noise and the news, between biases versus unbiased views, that's more than sufficient. I may have missed out completely Bitcoin rally. So be it, it doesn't matter. If I have made enough money on equity, that's good enough for me. I can't be jealous of my neighbors money making in cryptos if i try to copy him who knows it might be more dangerous each one of us will have to play according to our risk return profile and we will still end up achieving our financial freedom with that discipline the most critical thing in today's world is what is doable for me versus what is not doable for me i just can't copy my neighbor saying that he did this so i can also do it no he is different i am different very true, sir. And um, it's not only a market lesson, it's a life lesson for all of us to focus. So now we come to the end of this discussion and circling back to where we started from, uh, outlook for calendar year 2022. Um, so we are almost 90 weeks into this current rally and it's not that we haven't seen this earlier. So there was one instance of 2006 when this kind of a rally further got strengthened and had a further rise for a subsequent period of time, for a, a long period of time. And then we had 2011, where this kind of a duration of rally was followed by correction. So where do you see 2022 to be? So I believe 2022 investors will have to moderate their return expectations. Uh, this is the sixth year running. We, the past six years, past six calendar years have given positive return. So law of average has to catch up somewhere, but I will still bet that the seventh running year, we will get positive return. Uh, are there ifs and buts? Answer is undoubtedly yes. In a very simple word, if actual events turn out to be better than what is discounted by the market today, markets will rise. If actual event turns out to be worse than what is priced by the market, markets will fall. So what is market pricing today? It's pricing that Omicron will not result into severe disruption on economic activities. Marginal disruption, fine, but not severe. Number two, it is, accept, it is expecting that domestic institutional and retail investors will continue to buy. And FPI will eventually turn buyers. Maybe they are sellers in first quarter, first half, but CY22, net, they will be buyers. The Markets are also expecting that we are on course to achieve between 850 to 875 earning per share for Nifty in FY23. If profitability growth is in line with expectations, markets will continue to rise steadily. If there is unevenness, then there will be corresponding movement. Market is also expecting budget to be pro-growth and it will support equitable distribution. Now, if this kind of events don't materialize as per the expectations of the market, then there will be volatility or reaction. But overall, CY22 looks like where we'll have to worry about global factors impacting our market rather than local factors. I think locally, stars are aligned for steady rise in market. Globally, we need to be looking forward to various events. 
very well summarized sir and um, so now this is the end of our discussion thanks a lot for covering a variety of topics across the board and a few learnings for us and our investors would be that a quality never come cheap so you know if we are looking at a market valuation which is slightly stretched at certain points maybe there is an underlying quality and there is an interest for that uh, india moving from individual brilliance to collective brilliance and there you mentioned examples about cricket teams and how they have panned out over a period of time uh valuations being relative so you very correctly mentioned when you compare nfts to high pe stocks in india then high pe stocks in india would look dirt cheap uh a parity between private and public space which you mentioned was a very uh enlightening for us in terms of understanding the behavior of private space also and you mentioned about the natural cycle of price correction of commodities which we also believe in should kick in at some point of time thereby bringing some sanity to the inflation um so your discussion about correlating different examples with cricket with bollywood are really helpful because a lot of our investors could be able to relate to those without having to understand complicated jargons uh lastly to summarize uh, you mentioned in gujarati that half knowledge is dangerous and uh, we really thank you on behalf of our investors because experts like you provide us those gap areas which we have in our knowledge so that we don't end up committing mistakes with this we end our discussion thanks a lot for sparing out time today and wish you your team and entire family a happy and safe 2022 thank you